Hello and welcome to another Thought for the Day from New Milton Evangelical Free Church. Let's pray as we come to God's Word. Our Father, we come to your Word again with the humility of heart that wants to learn what you would have us know from its pages. So teach us, we pray, that we may be wise, that we may be loving, that we may be filled with your Spirit in order that we walk in this life as you desire us to walk and bring glory and honour to the name of Jesus. Amen. So we're in Joshua chapter 7 and we're reading the first five verses. But the Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the devoted things. Achan, son of Carmi, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, took some of them. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near Beth Avon, to the east of Bethel, and told them, Go up and spy out the region. So the men went up and spied out Ai. When they returned to Joshua, they said, Not all the army will have to go up against Ai. Send two or three thousand men to take it, and do not weary the whole army, for only a few people live there. So about three thousand went up, but they were routed by the men of Ai, who killed about thirty-six of them. They chased the Israelites from the city gate as far as the stone quarries, and struck them down on the slopes. At this the hearts of the people melted in fear and became like water. So Joshua is moving on from Jericho to look at the rest of the land and begin his incursion of Canaan and uh, seeking to capture it as God has promised that territory to them. Before we leave Jericho, just let me make mention of one thing which uh, I've just reread, known about this for a little while. Um, when you look at the archaeology of Jericho, it's absolutely fascinating. Uh, up until around 1600 BC, they estimate, it shows sign of, signs of Canaanite habitation. So the Canaanites lived there. A lot of Egyptian uh, persuasion, Egyptian relics, etc. So obviously they were influenced greatly uh, by Egypt. But then around 1600, this massive city with 12 foot thick city walls had some kind of traumatic in incident where, and it's surmised that there was an earthquake. That's the only kind of natural explanation for what happened. It made the walls fall down. So you can go to Jericho and you can see evidence that something made the walls crumble and fall outwards. And what was these massive great walls actually fell to become ramps up which the Israelites would be able to climb. So archaeology proves the Bible and Jericho stands out as a great indicator that this is how history attests to the stories that we see recorded in the Bible. So what's happening here? Great success, this massive victory as they take Jericho. But it's not all a story of greatness. This man Achan decides that he's gonna keep some of the plunder, some of the, uh, the, the, the goods that they capture in Jericho that have been uh, dedicated to destruction or uh, are to be brought into the use of the worship of God and God has instructed Joshua to instruct the people they're all aware of this they are not to take anything for themselves it's all actually going to be brought back and given to God but Achan decides to take some of the goods for himself we'll discover more of exactly what was involved then as a consequence what happens next is that this minor town Ai, uh, uh, jo Joshua sends out spies to see the land, the lie of the land. They come back and they give this incredible report that says, well, we don't need to really try very hard. Just send 3000 men up there. They'll take it in an instant. There aren't many people there. 
So these 3,000 go up and are completely defeated by this lesser town having just conquered Jericho itself. So the whole thing is turned around and notice the effect on Israel. We have previously read that because of God's mighty acts in bringing the Jews across the Jordan, because of the reputation that had preceded them with uh, news that when they had come out of Egypt, he had parted the Red Sea and defeated the Egyptian army. We read that the hearts of the Canaanites melted with fear and Rahab tells the spies about that but now it's turned round it's the people of God's hearts that are melted in fear and they become weak and scared and troubled and what's caused this graphic change it's caused by the disobedience of the one man and the covetousness and the greed that he exhibited and his refusal to do what God had commanded. So what's that to say to us? Well, if you've got a Bible open, flip forward to 1 Corinthians and chapter 10, which gives us an idea of why these kinds of things are recorded in our Old Testament. So remember that for a Christian, the whole of the Bible is ours. God speaks through all of it, not just the New Testament, not just what obviously is about Christ. Now listen to this, verse 6 of 1 Corinthians 10. These things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. And then Paul goes through much of the history of Israel in other respects. But then in verse 9 he says this, we should not test Christ as some of them did. So even in those Old Testament stories we've already seen Joshua stood before this incredible figure who turns out to be Jesus in some kind of human semblance. Here is Christ in these stories in the Old Testament. He is God, of course. So when they are actually dealing with their relationship with God, the covenant that he brings to them and includes them and involves them in, in uh, within, they are dealing with Christ. He is there in the pages of the Old Testament. And again in verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 10, Paul repeats, these things happen to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So if you are thinking, if you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. So this devastation that is caused to the armies of God and this loss of face in the in the face of their enemies is caused by their refusal uh, to accept that the, the commands of God this one man who actually is disobedient what does that say to us well it tells us that God doesn't mess with sin does he and Christian if you are a believer you are actually commanded to walk in the righteousness of Christ both as churches and as individual believers we cannot afford to play and toy with sin we're in a fight we're in a battle we're standing against the forces of the enemy the evil one is the prince of the power of the air he's all around us and unless we have the fortification in our hearts to stand firm which comes from our relationship with the risen savior and his spirit in our hearts unless we have that we will not stand just like these people, we will find that our hearts are overtaken in fear. We will be trembling in the face of the world and we will not be witnessing for Christ. How will we stand firm? By learning from these lessons, we don't trifle with sin. When we look at what we have given up for the sake of becoming the Lord's people, we must not go back to it. We must not yearn after, covet, seek, search for the things we have left behind us those things of the world are to be alienated from us put to one side we are to put off the old nature and put on the new nature the things which we might have once greatly enjoyed have got to be left behind so that we can move forward as a church and as individual christians so here is the graphic lesson of Achan, and it actually speaks to our hearts today Let's pray. Father, preserve us and protect us, we pray. 
we see that those verses in 1 Corinthians 10 go on to say that no temptation has overtaken us, which is not common, and that with the temptation you are faithful to provide the way of escape. So we thank you for your spirit who keeps us strong in the face of all that the evil one will throw at us. And we pray we may walk in the strength of that provision so that we give glory to Christ alone. Help us to lead on him alone for what we need to be his in this world. In his name we pray. Amen.